Hey everybody, what's up? Uh, Ray here. I just wanted to do another video. I've had a lot of questions from people asking my thoughts on certain things about the ending of the game. Again, even though I did the ending video, my personal thoughts on so a lot of popular theories that are out there now and what I think about it. So I'm just going to do a quick little video here talking about that. I want to start the video though by saying uh, I've seen a lot of people speculating, arguing that those whispers at the end of the game are not the characters from Advent Children. Rubrum, Viridi, and Croseo, the whispers, the whisper warriors that you fight at the end of it, that is absolutely Kadaji Azu and Laws, in my opinion, from Advent Children. And the Harbinger, the big Harbinger in the background is Genova. Um, they, they summon Bahamut, just like in Advent Children, and then you battle Sephiroth in the ruin Midgar, and after you fight him for a little bit, he sprouts the one wing for the final, the final confrontation or whatever, just like in Advent Children. Uh, creating the Whisperer version of Sephiroth is the Whisperer's last-ditch effort to deter the crew from altering fate. They basically pull the events that happen in that future timeline that they're trying to maintain and keep intact. They pull those events that happen and use that stuff to try and stop you. One last ditch effort, basically. Because the old crew may not have been strong enough to fight Kadaj, Yazoo, and Laws, and Jenova, and all that kind of stuff in the future, the way it happens. But they pull it off and they get through it. Uh, now, once they're defeated, the real Sephiroth shows himself to Cloud, and then they have their moment. They talk about the seven seconds before the end, Sephiroth talks about how he needs Cloud's help because that, that is the real Sephiroth. Talking to Cloud, that is the Cloud, that is the Sephiroth that is inside of Cloud's mind. He is taking up residence rent free in Cloud's mind. But that's really his consciousness too. Like through the Hojo experiments, the same Sephiroth and Genova DNA that's coursing through the planet is coursing through Cloud's veins. And it activates at certain times whenever Sephiroth wants to send him like a genetic email you know what i mean so whenever sephiroth feels like he needs to intervene on uh, against cloud in the game or to cloud he comes to him and talks to him so the seven seconds before the end is talking about a choice that cloud's going to have to make just before a meteor crashes into gaia there's seven seconds before the end they're there in the end of the game before holy enacts and comes and takes out Meteor. I feel like those things right there are exactly what that's talking about. Now, I have had, this is the reason I made the video right here pretty much, I have had a ton of people, a bunch of you, um, ask me if uh, I think Aerith is a time traveler of sorts. And though that seems to be the new pop theory out there, I see everybody, everybody with that theory. There's some kind of time travel thing happening here. I don't believe that's the case. Knowledge of time and existence on a universal level has always been commonly associated with the Cetra and the live stream. Since we know that Aerith can converse with the planet, the most logical and concrete answer to her knowing so many things and seemingly having things, having knowledge of things that she's not divulging to everyone is that the planet has entrusted her with some of that foresight. She's the last descendant of the Cetra, so the planet may look at Aerith as its ace in the hole, basically. So it's going to imbue her with a lot of knowledge. And it's a burden that she's not ready for. And that's made pretty obvious in the game, that they, you know, that they are writing Aerith to say, I don't want to know all this stuff, I just want to keep doing my thing. Shinra knows where I'm at. I'm living a peaceful existence. You know, uh, you know, me and my mom, we've got a nice little spot down here in, in the slums, beautiful flowers. People know me. People in my area love me. And my mom, we're taken care of. I, I don't want to do anything else. She doesn't want that responsibility. That's, that's Aerith's character in this first game. She's sassy. She's street smart. But she's also got this wisdom and knowledge of what she is supposed to become and possibly what her fate even is. And she doesn't want to leave home. She does not want to leave home. When she makes the comment at the end about missing the steel sky, that's a metaphor for her longing for the way her life was before the planet began to treat with her. Before the planet began to really dump a lot of its problems on her, basically. Uh, you know, the, ski the steel sky represents safety. Like, to her, I mean, that's her safe place. That's, that's the place where... She can be herself and live her life 
and not have to worry about being a Cetra. Now that all that's stripped away, you know, now that all that's gone and all that's done, and you know, she's ahead on our way, right? That that's why that track is called Ahead on Our Way, heading out, heading out into the world, you know. Now that now that they are doing that, she's uncertain. She's she's doesn't have that confidence that she had at home. So when she makes that comment, that's what that's referring to. And that really sums up her character arc for this first game. You know, reluctantly going out and seeing what she can do to help this situation, you know, because she knows what's on her shoulders. She understands by talking with the planet and having that knowledge given to her, <clears throat> that that's, that's her fate, that that's, she's going down that path and she doesn't necessarily want to do it. So in the beginning of the game, when we see the whispers hounding Aerith, I believe it's because she was leaving the area. Some things happen a bit differently this time because Sephiroth is now intervening in a different manner because of his understanding of how the Whispers and their tie to the planet work. So instead of Cloud racing straight away to where he and Aerith originally met, he's cut off by Sephiroth. This delays Cloud, in my opinion, uh, so that he may not come across Aerith. That's Sephiroth's plan, keep him away from Aerith. So then he intervenes again. This time, pointing out to Cloud that he basically can't save Aerith. He isn't stopping time, I don't believe, though. I mean, Cloud is basically having hallucinations triggered by the very real remnants of Sephiroth that are now a part of Cloud through Hojo's experimentation. So, basically, Aerith is being held there by the Whispers because Cloud was delayed in getting there. He should have been there a few minutes earlier. Aerith was getting ready to do her thing and head home when Cloud bumps into her. She's not selling any flowers. Nobody's buying any flowers. She's going to go home. Cloud caught her originally before she turned to head home. That's all that is. So the, the whispers hounding her right there, they're keeping her there so that her and Cloud can meet, so that the, the timeline can remain as it should be. That's my theory anyway on that. And then... The, the Whispers don't interact with Sephiroth because Sephiroth is not really there. He's in Cloud's mind. The Whispers are not a, uh, a thing from Cloud's mind. They're really there intervening on the physical plane. Sephiroth does not exist on the physical plane without his clones. Now, with his clones, he does. He, he injects himself into the clones, and I'm sure he talks to the clones like he talks to Cloud. Or not the clones, I'm sorry, not the clones, but the the, the research, uh, the, the failed experiments, the experimented on soldiers and stuff like that. He, uh, the black the black hooded guys. I'm sure he converses with them the same way he converses with Cloud, except he has, he has more control over them. He can actually become them, or they can become him, you know? So I don't exactly know how that genetic morph happens. It's something to do with the experimentation, I'm sure. But he doesn't have that same hold on Cloud. He is in Cloud's head, but he doesn't have that same hold on him. So whenever he appears to Cloud and just Cloud, no one else can see Sephiroth. At the, toward the end, when he starts making physical moves on people, and he slices that bridge when they're in the Shinra building, he actually walks by Palmer, and he stabs Barrett. And all those instances where other people besides Cloud see Sephiroth, that is a test subject that has been taken over by Sephiroth. And they show that at the end when Sephiroth jumps off of the Shinra building with Genova's remains and it shows that it's actually a test subject. The Whispers don't see Sephiroth, Aerith doesn't see Sephiroth, only Cloud sees Sephiroth. And he doesn't stop time. It's the, the way the brain works, things can happen that feel like many, many minutes go by and it can happen in a split second. That's how dreams work. When you dream, you, it feels like you're doing this thing for hours or whatever, but really it's only a few seconds. You know, that's how the brain works. It doesn't work on the same physical time that everything else does. And that's what's happening with Cloud's mental breaks. He's seeing, like when he saw the flashback with Tifa and Nibelheim in the first reactor with Jesse, he, he's only out of the conversation for a second or two. But that, that interaction in his head is just under a minute. So, I mean, time passes differently when you're talking about things like that. But anyway, moving on to the next thing. It's clear that the, the planet has many different types of home security systems, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
uh, it has its guard dogs, which are the weapons, right? So it's got those. And it kind of has its own like little ADT home security network now with the introduction of the Whispers, uh, the Arbiters of Fate. Uh, and who knows what else the planet has at its disposal to defend itself. And just like the weapons aren't evil, the Whispers aren't either. Like these aren't like evil guys or good guys. They're not helping one side or the other. They're helping the planet and that's it. They're they are an extension of the planet itself, sent out to keep things on the straight and narrow, keep things going the right way. So they're completely neutral. Of course, these are all just theories and speculation on my part. I'm just putting my little bit out there and see what makes sense to you all. This this is what I believe on this. So, it, And I'm putting it out there because I know people are going to believe different things. I know I'm not completely right, but I don't think I'm completely wrong. And I'm sure other people feel that way as well. And I've got a lot of other theories as I'm going back through the game again on like how how this person affects that thing Hojo's more far reaching role in this game what it, what that's probably going to be Shinra um, the things that are already there like, like I don't think that certain things physically are going to change I, I feel like Sephiroth's body is still in the Northern Crater his real physical body the weapons are going to awaken um and other plot points are going to remain intact for the most part. It's going to be interesting to see where everything else goes, though. I've got theories on Zack. I've got a whole other Just Zack video I'm planning. I touched on it in my other video, but I've got some more thoughts on it. And I want to play, finish my hard playthrough and get those story beats before I get into that anymore. Because I need to go back and listen to some other story points so I don't get this wrong. Because I might have it wrong. I think I remember hearing something differently, but I need to check on it. So anyway, if you all liked all that, please feel free to subscribe. If you haven't subscribed already, I really appreciate all of you. The, the influx of subscribers I've had lately has been great. I'm very, very appreciative to all of you. Uh, all of your support helps me out. I really appreciate it. It helped grow the channel. It's all big, so I appreciate it. Throw a thumbs up on that uh, video if you dug it. Share it around. Tell people about the channel. Share the videos. I appreciate all of you all who've been pumping me up on Twitter. So I see those, I respond to those, and I appreciate that. I'm going to leave it at that. You all have a great night. Keep rocking. I will be getting back on that stream tonight. We're going to be hitting Final Fantasy VII Remake hard mode. We are platinuming that thing. We're going to platinum it. But anyway, you all have a great night. Stay safe. Help each other out. Be good to each other. Keep rocking. I will see you all in the next video.